Thanks. Um, this is kind of the uh, ideal background lighting for a poetry reading. The sun just starting to go down behind sort of multi-layered trees. It's kind of beautiful. I'm grateful for that. Um, it's really nice to be here in your gorgeous city. Um, I'm going to start with a... I think I'll start with the first two poems from this, um, this collection. Some of the poems in here I wrote um, in the first two or three months of uh, my baby son's life. Um, and when babies are that age, they, uh, they cry for six to ten hours a day. And you're prepared for that because all of the baby books tell you that your baby is going to cry for six to ten hours a day. Um, but the reality of that gets, gets, gets obviously quite monotonous and quite hard. Um, and kind of just for variety. I would sometimes take him out for an afternoon walk uh, just to have, be a change from sort of wandering around the house with, with Edward crying at full volume just to be able to wander around the park with him crying at full volume instead. Um, and I set myself the task of um, trying to come up with not, not, not a poem because that was sort of overambitious, uh, but to come up with one image on every one of these walks for the first couple of months. Um, and it was a park and there were a lot of birds there, so most of the images were, to, most of the analogies were, were to do with birds. And there was one that I came up with about a Canada goose which I was particularly uh, satisfied with. And I ended up using it in about six or seven poems. Um, and then when I came to put the work that I'd done over the last couple of years to make this manuscript, um, the same image was in six or seven poems. And obviously, unless I was doing it deliberately as some kind of odd joke, having the same image come up again, um, I had to change it for, for other bird images. So there's a lot of quite weak bird imagery in this book. Um, but in this first one, there's one really good image for a Canada goose, which is kind of the best one in the collection. And it's for um, uh, my friend Tupa Snyder, who I haven't seen in a long time, and I haven't replied to any of her emails, and it's called We'll Write Properly Soon, which is something I found myself writing increasingly frequently in response to everybody's emails at the moment. We'll write properly soon. I never, ever do, and probably never will. Red pillbox in the middle of the pond, a bramble fences with the boundary line. A Canada goose twists its neck 180 degrees and rifles through its feathers Rolodex. The poor mad bird that preens its keister roar is the mistaken self-reflexive joke. The moorhen's varnished mute conquistador commands that you confess the world exists. The pram cracks over branches, fag butts, glass. My son cries like he sees my vilest thoughts screened on my eyes, like in a moment I'd exchange his love for these dumb details. The published ape under a dead white sky. The published ape wants a streetlight orange. And a student emails, what are poets for? A biochemist who should know better. I remember you, Tupa, five years ago, dropping poetry for ballet in bitterness, telling me your name's Russian for stupid, and that's why you chose it. And we said, no, that would be Tupoi, masculine, or Tupaya, feminine. Tupa is a Paraguayan creation god who made the world out of crushed centipedes. And you said, what, like, so in the beginning there were centipedes, like in the game Centipede, and then you said that you hated centipedes. I'm sorry, this is perfunctory at best and hardly fits four years failing to contact you at all. Look at the mallard's head. You had a coat that green. Thanks. <laughs> this one. Oh, you don't need to. Actually, clapping gives me a chance to pour some water. That's great. Thank you. But you genuinely don't have to clap after every put. Um, this, one is, this one's called Tragic Accident, and it's about... Um, Journalism. I guess it, I, I wrote it just before the whole sort of Levison thing and the whole, um, um, oh, I don't know, just the general sort of uh, news international scandals and all that kind of stuff. But I guess it was more, it, it, it was more about um, something being kind of rotten at the very uh, core of journalism that sort of almost starts at the kind of um, local journalism level, where as a kind of, uh, as a trainee, you're sent out to badger somebody who's just lost somebody and ask them. The woman who's just been um, sentenced to death for drug smuggling, um, there was a BBC journalist who, um, as she was leaving the courtroom, said, oh, how do you feel? How do you feel having just been sentenced to death? Can you, can you oh, well, how, do you, how does it feel? What does that feel like? And it was, it, and that's kind of the, that's, that's my problem with journalism, I guess, in general. Um, and this poem's about that. And it's sort of in the style of, it has no capital letters to be kind of the opposite of a headline, I guess. Um, and I also read the, um, the punctuation as if it were a sort of telegram which is a slightly irritating affectation, for which I apologize. Tragic accident. 
Rookie journalist on £8,000 per annum calls on bereaved parents to ask how feel about tragic scuba diving accident. Will ever be same again? Question mark. Was lovely, comma, bright boy? Question mark. Had limitless prospects? Question mark. Will say have to take one day at a time? Question mark. Interviews Coast Guard. Interviews diving instructor. Interviews other diving instructor to compare notes. Interviews policeman. Googles scuba diving accidents. Fills car with super unleaded. Eats microwavable rib sandwich. Weather colon sunny with gathering storm clouds. Concludes was tragic accident. Interviews school friends. Will be sorely missed? Question mark. Will ever be same again? Question mark. Is seeing fish close up really worth it? Question mark. Writes up copy, comma, emails. Drinks cup of instant coffee. Receives editor email. Where is insight? Question mark. Where is new take? Question mark. Sent back to parents. What really like losing child? Question mark. Unbearable? Question mark. Everyday living hell? Question mark. Decides hell with this. Decides kill editor. Sources samurai sword. Gets from weird old school friend who used to collect them. And what do you know still does? Zola. Asks editor how feel re imminent death. Scared out of wits, question mark. Shitting self, question mark. But what really feel like? Where is new take on imminent death, question mark. Kills editor, comma, self. Bodies discovered by cleaner, comma, 30, comma, Caucasian. What was like finding bodies, question mark. Traumatizing, question mark. Nothing could have prepared, question mark. Surprising amount of blood, question mark. Rookie hacks family interviewed. Their guess good as ours. Polite, comma, well-adjusted boy. Death cult, question mark. Drugs, question mark. In any case, life without not worth living. Campaign to ban samurai swords begins. Smoke, colored cat, licks, paws, comma, genitals in the forecourt. New editor reverses out of car park. Purchases bottle of wine, comma, stir fry, comma, lime cheesecake. Stop. Thank you. I think I'll read this one um, wherever it is I wrote this for my brother-in-law's wedding um, and it was kind of a challenge to write something that was kind of a, I guess a sort of sincere love poem or an attempt at a sincere love poem I can't find it which is appropriate sorry it is here yeah there we are yeah, so I read it at his wedding and, and people came up to me afterwards as people do after you read something at a wedding and they said, um, that was nice. It was nice that you got up and read that. That was nice. It's not really... I, I, I suppose it's not really a poem, really. You couldn't really call it a poem. But it was nice that you read it, anyway. Um, and I kind of just lost it. <laughs> so it's kind of... It's, it's largely in blank verse. There are frequent um, uses of alliteration in essence. What more do you want? Do you want it to be doggerel? Do you, is that what you, you... Just because you're the mother of the bride, you think you can kind of tell me what is and isn't it? As an isn't a poem. Um, but anyway, so this is kind of a speech stroke poem, I guess. Or just like chopped up prose. That's what people say when they don't believe in being a poem. Um, it's called Leatherbound Road. Should anybody ask me how we met, I'll read them Ansel Adams on photography, and I'll say it's in the way the artist brings out of the landscape what the frame brings out of the painting, which is to say you bring out the best in me, but not the way the Maillard reaction brings out the best in food through the combination of amino acids reducing sugars and heat. No, it's more the way the right wine brings out the right light and the scene reflected in your eye places me front and center, peering in, trying to describe the color. It's what the singer does between the words that makes the words the words and not just words. The way the crows that current stud the risen green don't startle as I cycle through and crunch the gears. The way distracted weavers weave their hair into the tapestry and a night which leapt six hours ago makes sense now. The way the symphony opens up only when you know what's coming next, your place in it and why or not. The way the past's not even past, and looking back, I overlooked the beauty of the worst of it. The exam flunked, the form misfiled, the blown bulb and the curtain drawn which gave the bar its votive glow. The way that led with more coincidence and happenstance than a minor Victorian novel, and yet with the absolute conviction of its binding and with gratitude to you. Thanks. I'm going to read one from this, um, this pamphlet, um, which is um, five um, song lyrics to show tunes and several prose poems. Um, and it's a sort of narrative piece, but I'll just read one, one thing from it. Um, and the main character, largely the narrator, is a, a sort of deposed general who, um, having failed in a sort of a, a militaristic coup, has been sent to sail around the world with, um, with who he's chosen as his people in this boat to, uh, to sort of think about what he's done for the rest of his life. Um, 
and it's kind of loosely about the, it's about how ideologies have sort of become museum pieces in a way, and that's not necessarily a protest. Some of the worst people I've ever met have been ideologues, um, but such as it is. Um, and this is one of, the, one of the song lyrics, but it's been uh, occluded, so the journal comes up with a, uh, an anecdote instead. Um, and the title of the song is, I may have many things to learn, but oh by God, it won't be you who teaches me. The bar is empty. On Maria's piano, there is a stave with the aforementioned title and a single note, high C, penciled in. I suppose you think that's terribly clever, I say out loud. It is my birthday. I have not celebrated a birthday since my 50th, two years ago. On my birthday, I had a beer with the chancellor, then took the limo home. At home, I found my six-year-old son holding a funeral for his favorite teddy bear. He was weeping and would not be comforted. The little bear was lying face up on a cardboard altar. My son had placed a tiny strip of toweling over his eyes. What are you talking about? My wife said, and her voice suggested that she was approaching the end of her tether. He isn't dead. Mr. Waffles isn't dead. My son was inconsolable. He died, he maintained. Mr. Waffles got ill and died. This isn't right, I said. Why do you think Mr. Waffles is dead? Just look at him, my son maintained. We buried the bear. I think this is kind of another narrative sequence, and if I try to read a couple of them, I just get carried away and read too much and horribly overread. So I'm just going to read the first one of this, which sort of places it in context. Um, and this is a sequence that concerns a man who's been placed in a halfway house, um, having, been, having been sectioned, and he's, he's in this halfway house to kind of recover, I guess, and to sort of re, retake his place as a, as a contributing member of society. Um, and it begins with these, with these case notes, which I'll, which I'll just read as a as a sort of intro to the poems. The rest of the book is narrated by him, but the first thing is just the, is the sort of psychiatrist notes. Case notes. Client 1764, now voluntary inpatient in locked ward three. Trialed on Draperidol, no noticeable improvement. Trialed on Quetiapine, reports some improvement. Trialed on Certindol, questions very nature of improvement stroke objective reality. Trialed on Primazide and reports curious godlike feeling. Trialed on Ilopeprodone and Zotapine, reports nothing. Trialed on Aripiprazole, client displays basic conversation and little excitement. Client publishes first collection of short stories with Charlie Horse books. Contact editor of Charlie Horse books, explain this very dangerous restate of client's mind, feeds into delusions, etc. Editor becomes demonstrative, client is unique and extraordinary talent, client is visionary, actually, we are fucking thought police. Explain editor, we are not thought police. Client danger to self stroke others. Client already sees self as author. Having book out only exacerbates aberration. And for what? Does book even sell? Editor hangs up. Client trialed on zuclopenthixol. Able to concentrate kitchen exercise. Able to concentrate washing and dressing exercise. Able to concentrate jigsaw puzzle of Magritte's Le Fille de l'Homme. Client recommended for remedial care at Four Acres Halfway House. I'm going to read a couple from this one, I think. There's a sort of formish kind of one hang on, somewhere or other. I think the page numbers are all wrong in this as well, which, which doesn't help. And this one is kind of a rondo um, called Men Made of Words. And um, it has a sort of, it has a notes section, which I think I'll leave out. I'll just read the rondo. Men made of words live in migraine hotels and talk not of music, but speaker cables. Stay up to drink whiskey with red lemonade, point out the mistakes one another has made of pronunciation, directions, and sales. Some compare charts before Prince of Kandinsky, some pick on the barmaid, Nebraskan and pretty. Their guiding philosophy never needs telling. The Fauvists, so colorful, what is it they're selling? Art never hurts for the men made of words. So if you, like I, often let down your guard when you're drunk in the hush of a theater courtyard, or forced to find work beneath travestied arches, you find yourself under the weight of their glances. Make your excuse while the handshakes are hard and run for your life from the men made of words. Thanks. I'll read this one called Spade as well, which is 
literally about um, a spade. And I wrote it when I was, I was preparing a talk on um, a French symbolist writer called Francis Ponge, who um, you may be familiar with. He wrote only about um, objects. And his technique in poetry was to start with a very precise physical description of the object, to gradually move away through a series of imaginative, imaginative leaps um, until he was writing about something quite different, until he was just in, sort of emerged, submerged in these kind of metaphors to do with the, the object. In his later work, he kind of starts after the leap, but you can't really tell how the things relate to the object um, itself. And I was kind of um, writing about why we don't really have an equivalent tradition to the symbolists um, in the UK, why it didn't really happen. And um, part of uh, my justification for that was that we have a, uh, a term of approbation. He's the kind of man who calls a spade a spade. Um, and and, and I, it got me to thinking, what would, a, what would a symbolist poet call a spade? So I wrote this. Flat-faced clown of the gazebo, lever that punctures the world, a seesaw we cleave to and see our own fate rising on the other side, piano of the shed's orchestra, a stick fastened to an evil cast-iron cartoon seagull, the opposite of a knife, for you cannot be used accidentally, the force and stance required renders us one animal. When the earth is gravelly, we sound like a distant car starting. When the earth is muddy, satisfying as a new word used surreptitiously in the right context. Once the hole is dug, the only thing I cannot bury in it is you, tamping down the sown earth like gunpowder in a cannon, puppet on a blue screen, dancing like a smug wand, suddenly disembodied from me, your erstwhile fossa, your mortal flubby ballast, your spluttering engine. Thanks. I'll finish on some of this um, wolf poem from this. I have a reoccurring character um, um, who is a, a, a talking wolf, um, which I've used in every collection, including this one. Even though this was a, an attempt to kind of consciously move away from the other collections, uh, the wolf ended up creeping back into this. The plot is generally that the wolf um, turns up in my apartment and proceeds to kind of act as a, as a sort of externalization of my, my, my worst fears, my sort of superego, I guess. Um, but the wolf kind of makes my life a misery for a season or two. Um, and that's what generally happens in the poems. And this is called Wolf Shibboleth. Um, Shibboleth, um, if you know your Old Testament, um, you'll know that Shibboleth means a kind of ear of corn or wheat. Um, and that uh, there are two main tribes um, one of these tribes couldn't pronounce uh, sh, couldn't make the sound sh, so they would say sibboleth, um, which is why we use shibboleth as a, as, a, as a dividing, as something that you can tell the difference between two groups of people, because whether, you know, whether they, whether they pronounce things in a certain way, and this is a poem about class and accent, I guess, um, because sometimes I get approached by people in pubs um, who make all manner of assumptions, you know, um, just based on, on the way that I sound. Um, so I wrote this as an exploration of that. Wolf shibboleth. It's not as self-pity as, as that make, there are a lot worse sort of judgments people can make, I guess. Um, chapter one. Oh yeah, there's always a, there's a recurring character who's Annabelle, who's kind of the narrator's girlfriend, and she's always just left, basically. She's always just left him again at the beginning of the poem. Before Annabelle leaves this time, she likens us to newsreaders when the lights dim a semitone and the credits roll. You lean over to make a joke so I can say something which looks natural, she says. And when it doesn't work, you throw your clipboard at me. You think too much, Annabelle, I tell her. I'm painting a little pewter figurine of the wolf. I'm painting his lips mauve. And besides, I'm tired, she says, softly closing the lime green front door we've never stripped. I hear her wheelie suitcase bounce down the front steps. Its click is like a cold chocolate bar snapping. The wolf arrives less than 15 minutes later. He quickly goes in and out of every room in the house like a nervous dog looking for Annabelle. Again, he says, oh, for the love of God. She thinks too much, I tell him. Evidently, says the wolf. As for me, I have retrained as a phonologist and independent scholar. My next book is to be called The Eschatology of Eschatology, or The Eschatology of Eschatology. I've not decided yet. There are interviews for a chair at your local university, so if you don't mind. The wolf sets his hat-top box on top of his steamer trunk and slaps it like a horse. Chapter 2. In my research so far, I have learned that there are two types of you, says the wolf. You and non-you. It was originally invented as an after-dinner card game by the Mitford sisters, but people took offense at it something awful. The war, I suppose. What on earth are you talking about? I fold my copy of How to Solve Cryptic Crosswords over my cryptic crossword. The wolf pours the coffee and says something inaudible. Pardon, I say. 
Very clever, says the wolf. Pardon, eh? Trying to pass as a chimney sweep, I suppose. The point is, I've worked out, he rearranges a bunch of papers and adjusts his spectacles, why you make people so uncomfortable. It is your accent. My accent is quite similar to yours, I tell him. But mine doesn't count, says the wolf. I have the necessary poise and elegance to pull it off. You are an Ephraimite, I am a Gileadite. And what does that have to do with anything? When the world ends, quite a lot, actually, says the wolf. I've written a list poem to illustrate my point. It's not very good, it's not finished, really. I hate it. Do I have to read it to you? I'm sure it's all right. I bet I'm on the poor. I'm joking, says the wolf. It's brilliant, as usual. Chapter three. The wolf assumes his poetry reading stance. You have the voice of the oppressor, he says. The voice of the second homeowner, the voice of the privately educated, the well-fed, the voice of the diplomat, ambassador, arms dealer, the voice of the pedant, the asset stripper, the voice of the slave driver, the colonial, the consulate, the voice of false modesty, the voice of my client will take that as advised, the voice of this is unacceptable, the voice of inheritance, capital, private income, the voice of the news circa 1960, the voice of the 11 course after dinner speaker, the voice of the fox hunter, the sherry drinker, the voice that had everything handed to it on a plate, a really nice plate, a voice that did not work its way up from nothing, a voice which did not start this company with one pound and a dream. A voice the sole purpose of oppositional art is to make splutter. What? what? This, this isn't art. A voice your contemporaries worked out it might be a good idea to drop about three months into secondary school. What do you think, he says, twiddling his tail. It's a bit listy, I say. You're a bit listy, says the wolf. Anyway, it doesn't matter what you think, as I have already published it. Chapter four. The wolf and I clean the living room with dusters and wood polish. A robin lands on the windowsill. It looks through the glass with its head cocked to one side as if it were about to say, really? Its chest inflates and deflates like a little balloon about to pop. Anyone can tell you are posh because you have a cheap television, says the wolf, spraying the big dark gray television with wood polish. You got it from a charity shop for 20 pounds and when it breaks, you'll get another one also for 20 pounds. That is very you. The average price of a non-you television is 1,799 pounds 99. It is so flat and thin you can hardly see it sideways on. It is also very shiny. The difference is this, the you don't want people to think that they care about things like television. That's as maybe, I tell him, but I got my sofa on credit. I'll still be paying for it in three years. And yet you call it a sofa, says the wolf. <laughs> World of sofas calls it a sofa, I protest. Next it'll be looking glass and chimney piece, says the wolf. Next you'll be calling the jack of clubs the knave of collywobbles. You might as well wear a monocle. These are all pretty outdated examples, I tell him. Well, class was invented by the Finnish Journal of Linguistics in 1952, says the wolf. So of course they're outdated. How about this room? Do you call it the lounge or the drawing room? The living room. You fucking coward, says the wolf. Chapter five, I'll talk you through it, he says, a history lesson. This will help me practice for my chair interview in a couple of months' time. It is twilight and we are sitting in the living room which smells like a brand new coffin. We are eating spaghetti carbonara which doesn't go well with the smell of the wood polish. The wolf has opened a bottle of room temperature champagne explaining that it is very non you to care about cold drinks. Whenever my eyes rest on a photograph of Annabelle, it's like seeing a picture of a Hollywood starlet from another era, that's how much I miss her. At one stage, it was desirable to imitate the language of your betters, says the wolf, so we attached great importance to whether somebody said pardon or what when they didn't hear you. The you said what because they were self-assured enough to be obnoxious, and the non-you said pardon because they mistakenly believed it was good manners. But really, they wanted to say what as much as their betters, only they couldn't because Ma would cuff them with a rolling pin. The betters called a rolling pin a poor man's barge pole, which they thought frightfully amusing. Where are you getting this from? I ask him. But now it's about not wanting to appear privileged, the wolf continues. Everybody wants everyone else to think that they had to work harder than they really did for the things that they have. Some yous have even taken to having their ears removed so as not to appear you. Hence the phrase, he's as much sense as an earless you. And there is also the east-west divide. I'm pretty sure it's the north-south divide, I tell him. Nope, says the wolf. Pretty certain it's east-west. And you wouldn't understand anyway. Chapter 6. At a time of great deprivation, a voice like yours is more than a social embarrassment, it is a liability, says the wolf. Therefore, it is not so much about saving face as it is about survival. What would you call this steamed pudding? Dessert, I suppose. The wolf pours custard out of the measuring jug. It is a pudding, I say, but we're having it for dessert. And the overall meal, asks the wolf? Supper. This is a complete disaster, spits the wolf. People hear your voice and they want to smash their pint glass and cut out your tongue. I'm not sure it's ever going to come to that, I say. You wait, says the wolf. You sound like the politicians explaining that we all have to make sacrifices. Say it, go on. I want to hear you say it. We all have to make sacrifices, I say. <laughs> the wolf opens a fourth bottle of passable Rioja. The cork sounds like a stupid person being mildly surprised. The point is nobody likes sacrifices, says the wolf, especially human or livestock sacrifices. You can be doubly certain that nobody likes you, so it seems to me that you have two choices. Downplay or exaggerate your personality. 
Mm, I say, either that or just not worry so much about what strangers think about. I'm sorry, the wolf interrupts. I couldn't hear you through all the silver spoons slapping out of your mouth. Chapter 7. We have slept through breakfast, so I prepare a nauseating lunch of Bloody Marys and tomato soup. The combination of ice cold and piping hot tomato is a unique and ghastly punishment for I know not what. The thing is, says the wolf, we're all the same, really. The you is as perfectly miserable drinking a post-opera gin and tonic in his private blimp as the non-you is with his pint of bitter in the public house after a long day's meat packing. My solution, the democratization of hats. The wolf produces a silly-looking hat. It is red and has several strings attached to miniature games. With everyone wearing the same cheerful hat, there'll be no easy way to differentiate, and everyone can distract themselves from the human condition with the attached novelties. Also, the hat contains a tiny file of time-release poison says the wolf, so that everyone dies of the same disease at exactly the same time. It's brilliant, I tell him, stirring half a can of milk into the Campbell's tomato soup. Sarcasm, says the wolf sadly. It's all very well for someone like you to make light of it. I'd advise you not to get ideas above your station. Everyone's going to be dead of poison in 44 years anyway. Chapter 8, the concluding chapter. I'll end on this. Thank you so much for listening. You've been delightful. Chapter 8. The wolf is offered and accepts the chair of phonology, using me as a case study. Your genius is in combining the worst habits of the you and the non-you, says the wolf. You drink too much, you're boring, you have a chip and an inverted chip on your shoulder, and you harp on and on about both of them all the time. Your vocabulary is a little try-hard, your enunciation is a mixture of outdated American sitcom teenager, you're simultaneously contentious and universally sycophantic, you're snobbish about books, films, and music, but you're dismissive of interior design and architecture, you eat at McDonald's one day and a Michelin-starred restaurant the next, you're capable of being crass and oversensitive in the same sentence, you're useless with money, you're in massive debt and yet you pay into a savings account, you're desperate for people to like you even though you secretly hate everyone. We run metrics on your data, and it turns out that you're exactly middle class, to the absolute median, to five decimal places. The department loved it. You're basically a celebrity. I'm very happy for you, I tell him. Crack open the warm champagne. For a mere £9,000 a year, children will learn of the intricacies of the class system from one of the foremost experts in the field, says the wolf. A new dawn. I start in September with a six-month sabbatical. Thank you very much for listening.